Hey, I'm John. Welcome to The Last Tuesday Show for October 2020. In this month's show, I've got some things lined up that I hope you're really going to enjoy. It's going to be some more question and answers. I'm going to take a look at one of the kits that I'm building for patrons. There's going to be a deep thought section, so we'll see what's been running through my head there. I've got a really fascinating Gumpla book recommendation that you may want to take a look at. Of course, the centerpiece of every last Tuesday episode is the interview. And I think you're really going to like the one this month because it's with Mark Sarastro from Sarastro's Painting. So let's get started. Many of you may be familiar with Joshua Dara. He's a, a modeler from Australia that in, uh, I think it was 2015, he won the Australian portion of the GBWC and he's participated in it uh, several times since then. You've also probably seen him on the Zaku Aurelius channel where they uh, take a look at, at various Gunpla and they comment on those. And you'll also see him on Gunpla Talk from time to time. He's a fantastic modeler. And he has a book that he's produced where he took his Zeta Gundam project from a few years back and went into uh, great detail producing a PDF book that shows everything he did to, to modify it. And I want to say the book, I'm, as I'm remembering out of the top of my head, I want to say the book has like 300 pages and over a thousand photos. So it's a very thorough resource. And if you've ever been interested in modifying and customizing your Gunpla, you're really going to want to look at this book because he shows you step by step every process he did on it, whether it's modifying vents or the feet or adding to the proportions or taking it away or you know cutting things away, adding things to it, changing shapes, and he shows step by step with great photography and showing the tools and the way he did things and a great narrative to explain it. It really is, in my opinion, the absolute best book I've seen yet for modifying Gunpla because it, it doesn't leave anything out. It, I've read through the entire book and it doesn't really leave any assumptions that you already know how to do something or that you know, there's sometimes you'll look at a book where they'll show you step A and then they'll show you another picture and say, and here's the result. But you realize that somewhere between what looks like A and B, there was actually A, B, C, D, E, F, and you're at G. He's going to show you everything that he did to that model to get it to look the way it did. And it looks fabulous. So if, if, you, if you're looking for something on how to modify your Gunpla, or really any model, especially sci-fi, I would urge you to check it out. Now, one of the cool things that he does is he just says, pay what you want for it. He's got some options on there. You can pay as little as a dollar. You could decide to pay $200. And I would urge you, and this is not something Josh has asked me to do. He doesn't actually know that I'm going to be doing this. But one of the things I would urge you to do is to, if you do purchase it, think in terms of, well, if you went to the store or if you bought, you know, from Amazon or from another online retailer, an actual book that was 300 pages and had a thousand photos and went into great detail, how much would you pay for that? You know, I got the FAQ from AK Interactive about aircraft a few years ago. It's been incredibly helpful to me. It cost me like $80. I'm not suggesting that you do that, but I would say when you click on whatever price you decide, think in terms of the work that Josh put into that and, and you know, give some honor to that because I think it's important that he be, and again, he doesn't know I'm saying this, but that he be compensated for the hard work he did. And especially because I, I can tell you, you're going to get a lot out of it because it goes into such great detail. But anyway, all that being said, check out Josh's book. I think you'll find it really helpful. There's going to be links down in the description below. And when you get to his site, you'll see all the details there. One of the questions that I was asked this month had to do with chipping. Uh, the question was basically, I I'm going to be working on a model that is desert colors, tan and dark brown. What should I pick for the chipping? 
there, there are several factors that go into uh, the, the chipping color that you choose. Certainly from a, a real world perspective, you have to think about what's underneath it, uh, underneath the paint. Is there a primer? What color is the primer? Is there a material underneath? What color is the material? Then there's also a scale modeling aspect. What, what can be seen? You know, when you're looking at it, what can I see to convey chipping? Now, a simple chipping scheme on that, uh, those colors would be to use a darker gray or a, a reddish, a darker reddish brown for the chipping on the tan. The darker gray would represent uh, that it's chipped down to either maybe a primer color or to underlying composite material that doesn't rust. If you're wanting to do some rust tones, opt for something that's a little more reddish brown because that starts to develop the, the rust. Then on the darker brown, what I generally do if I'm doing a very simple uh, chipping scheme is to, because I've assumed that the brown was painted over the tan, I just make the tan that is, forms the base of most of the model the chipping color for the dark brown. And it works really well to convey not only that the paint chipped, but that that paint went over the tan color. And then of course you can always go into those areas that you've chipped tan on the dark brown and add a few touches of whatever the darker color you used uh, on the tan is. So that's, that's how I would approach it from uh, just a very simple chipping scheme. Now if you're wanting to go a little more in depth into the chipping colors. What you can do, uh, what I like to do, is on, say for example, the tan color. I might initially use a lighter version of that tan to suggest scrapes in the tan paint, chips in the tan paint, that don't go all the way through the paint. If you look at any piece of equipment, that happens, you know, say a bulldozer or something, that happens. You'll see that if it's, I know I looked at one, took some photos of it, it was yellow. And then there were some areas of very light yellow where it had been scraped and it had a, a color difference between the surface area that hadn't been scraped and the surface area that, that had some scrapes but did not go all the way through the paint. So that, that initial light contrast chipping will suggest surface scratches. Then you're gonna have other scratches that will go down to another color. For example, if you decide that your object that you're modeling has a primer color, then you could chip down to that primer color, whatever that is. And then there can be another layer under that where it gets down to the actual underlying material. At each of those stages, decide what the color is because that will give you your guidance with regards to what color should you use and what is the order of chipping. Another thing to think about, and this is getting kind of really into the deep end of the pool, but if you're going to have multiple colors representing multiple ages of chips and multiple, multiple materials, you'd have to think about it. if you've got an area, say it's this big, on the real world object, and there's a chip that's maybe the size of my hand that goes into just the surface of the the the, uh, the paint itself, that may be a lighter color. Then there may be a smaller area that's chipped down to the primer. And let's say that primer is a red oxide. So you're going to have something inside of that lighter color that's red. And then if it goes all the way down to the base material, you're going to have something else inside of that. So there can be a lot of different layers of chipping going on. Another thing I always try to think of when it comes to chipping is I try to think in terms of contrast. Sometimes contrast may not necessarily reflect the most realistic or plausible thing, but if I'm wanting to convey the, the notion of chipping, then I have to think in terms of contrast. So for the tan color, you choose a dark color. For the, for the dark brown color, you choose a lighter color. Now, the, those colors can be driven by a lot of different factors, which I've just talked a little bit about. But remembering that the contrast is important in terms of presenting the model to the viewer 
you're not only trying to model perhaps a realistic thing or a plausible thing, but you're also trying to create, I guess you would say, an environment for the person that's looking at it. So chipping can help you bring out shapes and volumes on the model. It can help define detail. It can, it can draw the eye to a particular area. Maybe you've spent a lot of time painting a particular area. You think there's an area that is very interesting in terms of shapes and greeblies and everything else on the model. And so you can use chipping that's high contrast or maybe has a, a really almost shocking color change to draw the eye to that. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of more of, I guess you'd say if you're going for a more sophisticated advanced uh, chipping scheme, but all of those factors go into play in picking what colors you use for your chipping. Another question that came in this month was asking, should I put a gloss coat over metallic paint? And I'll have to admit, I'll have to give a, a little bit of a politician's answer here. It depends. It depends on several factors. One, what was the paint that you put on there in terms of the metallic? Is it a shiny metallic? Does it look really metal? Does it look just kind of metal flaky? Uh, or is it simply a paint that, you know, the bottle is label, labeled silver and you put it on and it's it's kind of more of a gloss gray. So the, the paint that you put down and the qualities about it are going to be uh, important in determining that answer. You know, the, the, the sheen especially on a metallic is very important because there's some that you can put on a model that it looks like metal. Uh, I've seen some airbrushed finishes uh, especially using uh, like Alclad lacquers and, and others like that, that when that's put onto a model, it looks like real metal. Then there's others that just kind of look kind of like a shiny, glossy, almost metal color. So look at the, the finish of the metallic before anything's been put over it. And then I think the second question you have to ask yourself is, what kind of finish am I going for? What do I want the final thing to look like? If you're really wanting a high gloss metallic finish, then often if you put on a metallic color that's very shiny, often the best thing to do is not gloss coat the metallic color. Gloss coat the rest of it. Maybe mask off that metallic area and gloss coat the rest. If it's a buffable metallic, meaning you can shine it up and polish it a little bit, then sometimes doing that shining and polishing is better than a gloss coat because a gloss coat can reduce the metallic look of it. It'll still be glossy, but it can reduce that metallic look. Now, if you're going for a more dull finish, uh, let's say you want it to look like a piece of worn metal, uh, you know, a military vehicle or something like that. I think a good approach there, rather than uh, hitting it with a matte coat, which you could do, I've done that, you could do that. I think what works well there is to do some matte streaking. And by that, I mean, instead of say airbrushing on a matte coat, to take a brush, thin down some matte paint and do some streaking, almost like you would for mud or anything else, and do some streaking so that you have areas that retain that shiny metallic look, but then there's other areas that make it look dull. And you can even add other effects over it, say uh, rain marks and dust marks and where dirt has run down. But by leaving just a little bit of the shiny metallic poking through, it really sells the notion that, okay, this is a piece of metal that, you know, it doesn't rust, it's really tough, and there's stuff on top of it. But if you just were to go up there and take a wet cloth and wipe it down, you would get a really shiny metallic underneath. So. In general, if it's a good metallic coat, I wouldn't gloss coat over it. I would leave it as is. But if you're going for a slightly different finish, then think in terms of what you want the final finish to be as to what kind of things go over the top of it. One of the projects that I'm working on is a Patreon exclusive video build, and it's of the Rocket Models 135th scale Kabuto Kai, which is a walking tank 
thing from their Fists of War series. Now, the Fists of War series is basically an alternate World War II timeline that sees it going on for a couple of more years and that there are walking tanks that proliferate the battlefield and they have various kits from various countries that portray these. And I picked uh, this one mainly because it had just been released and I thought it really looked cool. But you can see that I've been working on the interior here and uh, it's, a, it's a very good interior. Uh, lots of detail and plenty of uh, greeblies to to weather and to chip up and things like that. So if you're interested in seeing this progress and seeing the other uh, Patreon exclusive builds available, then uh, be sure and check in the link below uh, for Patreon and uh, you can see what that's, that's all about. But even if you don't, if you think uh, walking tanks are a cool thing, be sure and check out the Fists of War series from Rocket Models. You may find something you really like to build. Well, I've been thinking again, so that means it's time for some deep thoughts. I was having a conversation with a friend recently uh, about an experience he had on social media. Someone had posted up a photo and they had kind of explained what they had done and what stage they were at in the model build. And they finished up by saying, comment and critique, welcome. So as he did as many of us do, he looked at it and evaluated it and went into reply and said some nice things about it because he said there were definitely some positive points to it. And then he just made a couple of observations about a few things that could be improved. And he, he actually sent me his wording and I, it was quite kind and appropriate, I thought. And, uh, and so he hit reply and didn't think anything of it. And then it wasn't too long after that that he got a reply from the person who had asked for the CNC, and they really weren't happy with the fact that he had actually offered comment and critique. And, and he was mentioning to me his frustration with, you know, basically, I was just trying to be helpful. And yet I get this reply. And he said something that kind of struck me. He said, you know, from now on, I'm just not going to offer any comment or critique or any observation. I'm just not going to say anything. Now, I understand his sentiment. I really do. We've probably all been in that position where, you know, we do something and it doesn't go the way we thought and we had the best of intentions and we just kind of want to throw up our hands and go, why am I bothering? Why am I doing this? But I encouraged him to continue being engaged and offering positive, not only encouragement, but comment and critique where appropriate. Because I think that while the, for the most part, things in social media are generally positive, you're going to get some, hey, that looks great and stuff like that. And you're going to get some critique and you're going to get some helpful things and you're going to get sometimes things that aren't so helpful. I think if you're one of those folks who likes encouraging people, who likes offering observation, or maybe even just saying, yeah, I have the same problem. You know, if you find a good solution, let me know. If you're one of those people who likes engaging on that level, don't let pushback discourage you from doing that. And, you know, you know who you are. If, if you're one of those folks that and come on, let's all admit it. There's a few folks out there that are a bit bitter and a bit acidic. And even in their kindest replies, you get a taste of that. I'm not talking to y'all. There's a whole nother deep thought for that. But if you're somebody who really does feel like that you have something to offer and you want to encourage your fellow modelers and you want to help them, you know, that's one of the things that's most important to me in what I do. I like building models. I'm going to build models no matter what. But being helpful is so very important. And it's what so many people really strive to do. It's what drives me. I hope this that I do is helpful for people. That it's, it's not, you know, yeah, maybe it's just a little passing of the time. Or, you know, yeah, that's kind of interesting. But at the end of the day, to get some feedback, some comment and critique, I know for me personally, that says, I found that helpful. I found that useful. I found that to be something 
that helped me grow in the hobby, helped me see it in a different way, helped me with this particular technique or that particular technique, don't let negative pushback discourage you from doing that because that's the thing we need the most in this hobby from a community standpoint, from a group standpoint. You know, when we're sitting here modeling by ourselves and we're lost in what we're doing, we don't think about that kind of thing. But when we get into socials and we start engaging with other people, having those around who are helpful and encouraging and just really try to build people up is something that's good for all of us. So if you've ever been in that position and you're starting to think, why do I even bother? Keep bothering. People need to hear encouragement and good, helpful critique and comment because it helps them grow. And when people start seeing that you have a reputation for doing that, you're going to get a lot of positive feedback coming back to you. You're going to get a lot of encouragement yourself. And at the end of the day, you're going to be able to lay your head on the pillow and say, well, in this hobby that I've chosen to be in, I'm doing my very best to participate in it well. And finally, if you've had any kind of deep thoughts along these lines, if you've had an experience like I've described, let me know in the comments below. Or maybe there's something else you've run into that you found interesting. Let me know. I'd love to hear from you. As I mentioned earlier, the interview for this month is with Mark Sarastro from Sarastro's Painting. Now, if you're not familiar with Sarastro's Painting, that's a channel on YouTube. And what Mark does is he essentially paints uh, figures from various uh, tabletop gaming franchises like the Star Wars Legion and Imperial Assault, uh, Lord of the Rings, and Marvel Crisis Protocol, as well as quite a few others. He has a, a long body of work out there that just covers so many different topics. And he always goes very deep into color and blending and shading and all sorts of topics like that. And he does it in a very accessible way so that when you watch it, you come away going, you know, I think I can do this. What's even more remarkable is not just his painting, but when you see his videos, and if you've seen them, you know what I'm talking about. The videography is wonderful. The narration is great. And he even composes his own music. I just, I'm just blown away at how talented a guy Mark is. But the cool thing is, he's also a really nice guy. And it was so much fun to be able to sit down and talk with him for a little while. All right, whether you paint miniature figures or not, I'm betting many of you know today's guest. We are so blessed to be joined by Mark Sarastro from Sarastro's Painting. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Thank you for being here. So for those who may not know who you are, give us the 30-second version of who you are and what it is you do. My name's Mark, and I produce miniature painting tutorials for my YouTube channel, Sarastro's Painting, and I've been doing that for the last seven years now. That's it's And it's a great channel. If you have not subscribed to Mark's channel, there'll be links down below in the description. So please be sure and, uh, and uh, check that out. Now, you are a wonderfully talented artist. You do great video, you do great narration, and you even write the music that is in the background of your videos. Is your background in arts like this, or do you come from another background in terms of training and things like that? So yeah, in terms of formal training, my background lies in both art and music. So I studied art up to sort of college level, mm -hmm. but then I switched and focused on music, which I took as my degree. And I also then went on to teach music for many years. I also did a bit of teaching in IT and digital media as well. Um, so those two areas have always been big parts of my life. I mean, as a kid, I was always at the piano, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in, improvising, tinkering, composing. So, yeah. So, so what you do now is kind of an extension of what you've always done. Very much so. Yes. Yeah. I, I, all the things that I enjoyed doing and got excited about as a kid, mm -hmm. I, I, I use them now in, in what I do. Um, and other things as well, like photography and videography. I've always enjoyed those as a, from a hobby standpoint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was actually when I got my first DSLR camera that was capable of shooting video that I 
I felt inspired to create my first painting video just just to satisfy ah. that creative itch. I was yeah. so excited that I had something that could shoot video digitally. That's, and I, that's I happened cool. to be painting zombie side at the time. And it was just a chance for me to put all of those passions together into a single thing. Uh, so that's what that's what gave rise to my very first video. Wow, that's that's interesting. Okay, that's cool. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, with with all of the things in your background, can we expect at some future date, perhaps vocals and dance numbers to come from uh, you? <laughs> I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. <laughs> Uh, I don't have a good singing voice, so no. So, so we won't we won't have an episode of Sarastro singing and dancing, huh? No, <laughs> no time soon. <laughs> okay, at some time you started with figure number one. That's one of the things when when people contact me and say, "Well, how do I do this?" Or I'm having trouble with that. I always remind them, everybody starts with figure one, with model one. In your mind, was there anything that stands out that was particularly difficult initially or hard for you to do? How did you work through that? Uh, I don't I don't recall a specific first mini as such because it was so long ago. <laughs> um, I mean, I started painting at the age of I don't know, five or six, just those big airfix, oh, dinosaurs, yeah. airplanes, that sort of thing. Yeah. And then... Warhammer Fantasy Battle, this is before 40K, then 40K and so on. Mm -hmm. So I don't recall a, a first particular miniature. I suppose in terms of how to work through something you find difficult, I guess you've just got to firstly lose any fear you might have mm -hmm. of, of, of making mistakes and just practice. And if you've got spare miniatures or unwanted miniatures, that's that's the great way to practice because you're not, worried about messing things up. You're just trying ideas out, trying colors, trying techniques. Yeah. And there's no no wrong thing. It's just you produce a result, you reflect on how close it is to what it is you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and then try again if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's such an important uh, key for for paint for especially for new painters to remember is you're 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 gonna have results that are less than what you expect initially. But you have to go through that to get to what it is you're wanting to do. Well, in what you paint now, in, in your work now, is there anything that you do that you you're as you're doing it, you're thinking, I wish I did this better? What are you working on currently? Because I know many people might look at you and go, well, this guy just he knows how to do everything. But what are some things perhaps that you work on now that you go, I wish I did this better? And how do you continue to address that? Uh, well, I'm always looking for ways to push myself with each mini that I paint. Mm -hmm. And I don't sort of, in my mind, think, oh, I wish I was better at X, Y, Z. It's more a question of, right, what what new challenge am I going to try and develop now? You know, yeah. so it, it's, um, it's a growth thing. So mm -hmm. I suppose at the moment, I think I'm becoming a fair bit bolder with my color choices and color handling, mm -hmm. which I think you can see most evidently in the crisis protocol. Yes. And that was one of the main reasons that I was drawn to the game was because of mm -hmm. the, the superhero genre, the colors, bright colors, the textures. Um, I knew it was going to be an exciting range to paint that would allow me to stretch myself. Yeah. So, so color handling is always an ongoing sort of area of development. I suppose non-metallic metal is something I've been, I've been getting into over the last year or so. Yeah. I've certainly not mastered it by any means but it's a really fun and creative way to work so i'm enjoying that at the moment as well yeah that that that's something that i admire when i see people that can really do non-metallic metal because it is difficult to get the 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 lighting correct i mean you're recreating all of the things that happen with with metallics so yeah that would that would be really cool and i will say for your marvel crisis protocol i love the colors on those they're so bright and vivid uh, before we started recording, we were talking about your recent Kingpin video, and you you even made just white and purple really pop and just have so much depth. So Thank you. that's some great stuff. Um, do you have any offline builds that you like to do? It's not for video. It's not for PDF. It's just something that you say, I'm just going to sit down and paint this for me. Do you have anything like that? It's, it's very rare that I do that. 
there's occasionally I will just paint a figure. Like mm-hmm. uh, a week or two ago, I painted the Miles Morales Spider Man. But even mm-hmm. then, um, I feel I, I feel the least I could do is just jot the colors down and, and then maybe share a post on Patreon. Yeah, at least share what the colors are in case anyone's curious. Yeah, the 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 terrain that I built for Crisis Protocol last year. Oh yeah, that that was a project that I initially did not envisage making a video for. Mm. Partly because I didn't really know what I was doing. So I thought, <laughs> how, how can I possibly make a guide when I, I'm just sort of learning myself on the fly, as it were? So I'd, I'd looked at the work of people like Mel, the terrain tutor. Mm-hmm. I bought a whole range of different materials because I didn't know what was going to work best. You know, So I got lots of different types of those brick textures to try out, different yeah. windows and doors from various train, miniature train companies and so on. But by the time I'd gotten to the sort of my last of those four tiles, if you remember, mm-hmm. I made four yeah. one and a half foot square tiles. I thought, oh, I feel I feel confident enough in what I'm doing. And the project was such a massive endeavor. It was very time consuming, but fun. Mm-hmm. Um, it felt like it would be a shame for me not to put some kind of video together to share what, what yeah. I'm doing. So that, that became a video. Yeah. Um, although it was shot kind of, it was all shot in the kitchen without proper lighting and so on. I just thought, <laughs> just to get some record of what I'd done for the benefit yeah. of viewers, you might want to go and try something. So in, to answer your original question, there's not much that I do hobby-wise that doesn't make it into mm-hmm. either a video or a PDF or some kind of post. For yeah. Draw worse, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it, it is refreshing when I do just paint without mm-hmm. any regard for formalizing what I'm doing or yeah. recording what I'm doing. You're just being intuitive, trying things out, being a bit messy. You know, my mm-hmm. Miles Morales is, is kind of scrappy, but it's fun and it's, <laughs> it's got energy and it's got the colors and texture that I was after. I, I think I've just reached the point where my hobby and the way I earn a living have, have become one, <laughs> practically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is good, which is good. Um, so yeah, there's not much that I do that doesn't sort of make its way onto the internet. Yeah, I, I can understand that because there's as you're doing anything, when when you're doing it for a living, you have to think, okay, what is the content value of this? Yeah, so I understand that. And I will say that that terrain for the Marvel Crisis Protocol, that was beautiful work. I loved that. So Thank it you. it it both encourages me and yet discourages me that you thought, <laughs> hey, I'll give this a shot. Then <laughs> That's what you turn because I've tried some terrain and I said, yeah, it's not quite that good. But that that was some awesome stuff. Well, you you mentioned one already, so it's kind of a nice segue into uh, who are some creators that inspire you, some people that you look to, whether it's for terrain or painting or or just maybe color inspiration, any of that. Who are some people who inspire you? Um, well, in terms of miniature painters, people like um, Sergio Calvo. Mm-hmm. His colors are just mind-blowing um Kirill Kaniev he's he's like su- super advanced um colors textures his non-metallic metal works incredible mm-hmm. uh, Alfonso Giraldez mm-hmm. Roman Laplatte I like his work as well yeah. very soulful very ambient yeah uh, and also I, I I take inspiration from the the historical artists you know mm-hmm. from the sort of you know renaissance up because they, they nailed all that stuff. They they were <laughs> they had non-metallic metals down. They were so good at rendering different materials. You know, if you look at all the royal portraiture where you've got like satins and half see-through materials and so on. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds you can you can you can take from looking at that stuff. Yeah. And also if I'm out and about anywhere, I'm always looking and photographing stuff mm-hmm. to keep as reference, whether it's a marble statue in a museum or a gallery or yeah. just a rusty, you know, uh, grid on the ground or something, mm-hmm. you know, any, any bit interesting bit of color or texture, I always just whip the phone out and get yeah. some pictures. That, that's handy to have. We always have our phone with oh, us yeah. now and you can just, there's inspiration. Take it right then. Yeah. Do you, do you do much practice work? Uh, when you're preparing for a video or a, a new series or something, or is it you just grab your paints and grab your brushes and just kind of charge ahead? <laughs> yeah, no practice. Yeah, as far as I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
occasionally I will actually buy multiple copies. So I'll buy two copies of of a figure, say. Yeah. If it's if it's some something that daunts me and I know I really want to practice just to develop the confidence and know that I'm I'm sure of what I'm doing before yeah. I hit record. Uh, other times that's not not possible or financially feasible. <laughs> you know, I'm not mm-hmm. gonna buy all of the crisis protocol stuff twice, for example. Yeah. But I do have a huge tray of spare figures. Mm-hmm. So even if it's not the figure I'm painting, it gives me a chance to test out either individual colors or textures or ideas, yeah. but also complete color schemes. Mm-hmm. So I've got kind of, I'll have maybe, a, uh, I've got sort of Star Wars miniatures that have completely, they've got four color schemes on them, for example. <laughs> yeah. Just because it, it doesn't matter if the miniature just is, isn't right. Yeah. It, it gives me a chance to test the scheme out and make sure I'm happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I do practice before. I mean, in the videos themselves, I do sometimes still try something on the fly or improvise a little. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got to allow for that to give it that, you know, the unknown sort of yeah. bit of, I mean, the, the, speaking of Thor, for example, the hammer, I, I didn't originally intend to put the lightning effects on. Yeah. But I was just do I was originally just going to do some sort of pale blue gradients. But I think I actually scraped a little part of the hammer and it left a bit of white underneath. And I thought, oh, that looks that looks that could work. So then I went with the white streaking idea. Um, so, so there are times when you do sort of go off off script a bit. So that was that was truly a Bob Ross happy accident. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Now, in looking back over the miniatures that you've done, because you've done a, a the large number of your body of work is very impressive in terms of, you know, YouTube, just years on YouTube. Are there any that you look back at that you think, man, I wish I could go back and redo that. It would be fun to do it. Or I uh, wish I could redo that one. Anything like that? Uh, not really. I mean, I, if I look back, I can certainly see progression in my painting, mm-hmm. which is good. Uh, and if I were, was to repaint something that I may have painted five or six years ago, I'd like to think I certainly would do it differently. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I not particularly want to go back and repaint anything. Gotcha. It's, it's gotcha. a record of your achievements in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and you can see it in the videos, especially if I paint, say, a character like Darth Vader from one game, and then a few mm-hmm. years later, I revisit and paint like the Star Wars Legion version. Mm-hmm. And there's quite a big jump in terms of the confidence of the way I approached the miniature there. Yeah. For example. So, yeah, but it's, it's nothing I would want to go back and erase or change. It's just a, it's a natural uh, record of your progression, I think. Well, when you went a few years ago, you went full time as a YouTube creator. Um, mm. And, and I'm sure that had to be, even if you had planned for it, I'm sure that had to be a moment of, of, okay, well, here we go. Um, had, had you done a lot of preparation ahead of time for that? Uh, did, or did you have kind of a moment of, that, that first day of going, well, here goes nothing. How did how did that process go for you? Uh, it was kind of scary. Uh, it's, it still is in a way, because you, you, you to go from having a fixed regular income to sort of something that does go up and down a bit, it's, it's kind yeah. of scary. But it was also very exhilarating. Mm-hmm. And it happened at a time when I was growing increasingly unhappy in my previous job. Mm-hmm. And I think I'd also reached an age, a, a time of my life when I was, I, I was fully aware of how short life can be. And yeah. I would not want to get to the end of my life and look back with regret having not tried something. Yeah. And I told myself, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, I can always go back to, to teaching if need be. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, and, and, but also it was, I had sort of al- almost an uncharacteristic level of faith in what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've got as much insecurity as the next person, but in what I was doing, I, I felt quite certain that mm-hmm. this is going to work. And that's probably um, in, in large part, thanks to my patrons and supporters. Yeah. Because they're, they're the ones who fund the vast majority of my work. Yeah. And that, that was that was true at the time, and it's still true now. And so it was a bit of a leap of faith yeah um but i I put my faith in my 
supporters to, to carry me through that, that yeah. transition. Um, and I guess I always just believed in the simple idea that if I, if I keep my head down and focus on the, the project, the video, make each mm -hmm. video as good as it can possibly be, mm -hmm. everything else will flow from that. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the best at, um, sort of the marketing side of things, particularly, I'm not even a very good YouTuber. I don't sort of, I don't consider myself a YouTuber in many ways. I don't produce sort of weekly content. Um, I don't produce content that could necessarily pull in the biggest audience. Yeah. Um, but I don't have to because it's, it's my patrons that fund what I do. And as, as long as I have enough people interested enough to support what I do, then I can carry on producing exactly the kind of videos that I like. Mm -hmm. So that that simple core principle was was true at the time, and it it, it still is now. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's did that answer your question. No, yes, that, no, that's that's, okay. a, that's a great answer. That's and it's also a great. I, I was wanted to make sure I mentioned uh, to the audience if you have there's going to be a link down below to Mark's Patreon page, and I would I would encourage you to go take a look at that and uh, see the various levels he offers and uh, consider supporting him because one of the things I appreciate about, about what you do is you paint. You don't, you don't talk about painting. You, you don't examine painting, you paint and you demonstrate. And I think from a consumer standpoint, someone who consumes video and tries to paint, I find that really helpful. So <laughs> please continue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I appreciate in, in watching your videos is you'll often identify a break point somewhere in the video that you'll say, OK, this is tabletop ready. I mean, if you know, here's a standard that you've gotten it to it's tabletop ready. And then you'll say, now, you know, here's some further refinements that you can do. Now, I'm I'm going to guess I may be wrong, but is that the gamer coming out in you? Um, how much time do you have for gaming uh, when when you've got all these other things going on? So. I, I think the one of one of the main reasons I often like to present a kind of stopping point is it's purely for the benefit of my viewers. And I, after having, when I first said that in one of my early videos, I did have feedback from people saying they really like it when I say the words "and" ah. if you want. I mean, it's mm -hmm. funny you can stop whenever you want anyway, but yeah, <laughs> you just like to hear it. So, um, and I'm aware that. Not everyone wants to spend X number of hours refining and tweaking. Yeah. On something that looks decent enough to play with. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it's good to try and please parts of the audience that may want to push things a little bit further or have a bit more time or a bit more skill. So I guess it's just about what we call in the education is differentiation, mm -hmm. differentiating the tasks so that people of different levels or needs can still achieve what they want. Okay. Time and time. You asked about time for gaming. Yeah. So I play. I have a weekly game night with a couple of local gamers. Ah, okay. Um, so that forces me to stop whatever I'm doing. I go out. It's a twenty minute walk away, and we we game. So mm -hmm. at the moment we're in the middle of a Kingdom Death Monster. Ah, okay. So that's going really well, and that's also kind of spurring me on to paint more of the upcoming monsters that we're going to face in the game. Yeah. Yeah, that's something. Uh, and then at home, uh, I like to play with the, with the family, with the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter, who's 12, is currently running a Dungeons and Dragons adventure with us. Oh, how about so that? That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and if we're not playing that, uh, we love to play Crisis Protocol, mm -hmm. Star Wars Legion sometimes, or the card game, the LCG card games, mm -hmm. um, Lord of the Rings. We tried Game of Thrones for the first time a few weeks ago because my daughter's enjoying the books at the moment. So yeah, stuff like that. Interesting. Interesting. Now watching your work is very much uh, continual. I'll, I'll call it a deep dive beyond just color. I mean, you, you talk about light and shadow and contrast, but you also talk about the reasons for why you're doing things and the, and the choices and stuff. And I've heard you often say, you know, I'm going to push the highlights further or something like that. When you're, when you're starting to plan for a figure, how do you determine what what's right for that figure? What it is you're trying to accomplish? What are some things you look for? Talk us through that process. Uh, I suppose it's it's important, uh, or I try to have a clear vision of how I want the thing to look. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the way I do that is firstly by, because what a lot of what I paint is, is franchise based stuff. So the, yeah. there's a reference there, whether it's movies, comics, artwork, illustrations, character art from the game manuals and all that sort of stuff. So I'll, I'll look at all of that, like Kingpin, for example, mm -hmm. Google Kingpin, see how he's been represented in the comics and TV shows and so on, and then pick the elements that I find visually appealing from that. I'm I'm a lot stricter with myself when it comes to the Star Wars stuff, because it's it it, it has only been although there are now the comics of course yeah they they are also based on the look of the characters from the movies so yeah there, there's there's less wiggle room there whereas the Marvel characters you know the, the uniforms often change the outfits change yeah and there's a bit more freedom and kind of um more more freedom with the Marvel stuff. So having a clear idea in my head of how I want the figure to look is the first thing. And then it's just using all of your skills and knowledge to, to follow through with that, that plan to bring the vision to life. Mm -hmm. So with Thor, for example, I knew that I wanted, he's basically a sort of, he's like a triangle, isn't he? The miniature mm -hmm. with, his, with his hammer at the top. I knew yeah. that I wanted this blue light emanating mm -hmm. from the hammer and that, the whole thing was basically going to be a gradient down to some warmer sort of complementary orangey tones towards yeah. the bottom. So once you once you have that that plan or vision, you then execute it. Mm -hmm. Some I mean sometimes you you, you don't need to be so uh, uh, rigid. You can just sort of just start painting. Yeah, and if you don't like something, try something else. But that's just not going to make for such an easy video to follow. Yeah. If I go, right, I'm going to paint this blue. Oh, no, actually, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to go back. Yeah. No, no, forget that. Forget that. I'm going to. So, so I'm perhaps a bit more uh, rigid simply because I'm presenting a tutorial that I want to be easy to follow. Yeah. Yeah. But when you have the plan, you then execute it. And so with the Thor, for example, having the plan is important because there'll be stages in the process where it looks kind of weird or wrong. Mm -hmm. Like as I started highlighting the the object source lighting on his arm. He's got this blue, quite a bright blue arm. Um, he looked a bit like Ed Harris from, what was that film, The Abyss, where he has to put his arm down the toilet to get the, <laughs> the wife's ring. Uh, and at that moment, the, the, you're thinking, well, what's he doing? It looks crazy. Because without without the rest, it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. But as long as you have the vision and you stick to it, eventually, hopefully, it all sort of comes together. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard uh, Lincoln Wright from Paint on Plastic I've heard him say frequently that you start loose and then tighten it up all along as you go. Yeah. 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 Is, is there a line of minis, miniature figures from any franchise that is not available now that you would enjoy someone create, see someone create and release? Fantasy Flight Games have done the Mansions of Madness games. Mm -hmm. I'd quite like to see um, HP Lovecraft themed stuff, but Mm -hmm. cast in the same kind of quality sculpts that we see, say, in Crisis Protocol. Yeah. The mansions, they're, they're fine for board gaming pieces, but the plastic's kind of a bit rubbery and the details mm -hmm. are not amazing. So it'd be nice to see some really high quality, hard plastic detailed sculpts of those, all the investigators and the monsters and stuff. I could imagine that being quite fun to work. All right. We're going to take a brief diversion here. We get to what I call the lightning round. Um, any answers, any answers. Okay. So, uh, we'll start off Vallejo or Citadel. Vallejo. Vallejo. Mostly, right. but, but you know, some Citadel as well, you know, um, <laughs> but that's a hard one. Cause within any paint range, there's some products that are better than others within the range. So yeah, which is why yeah. you see me using so many different paint ranges in a video. Cause you know, oh, I like this. I'll have a bit of that. Uh, yeah, but overall, I was, overall, I would say Vallejo over Citadel. Yeah, I, I was actually thinking before we talked, I, I was thinking, you know, that if you ever decide this isn't your gig, you could probably become, become a paint salesman because I'm sure you have <laughs> quite a bit of paint. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question. Figures or vehicles? I like painting the occasional vehicle, but figures overall because it's just a bit more for that personal yeah. emotion thing. Yeah. Yeah. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Coffee. All right. Yeah. Non oil or Agrax Earthshade? Or both. <laughs> both. Yeah. Sure they're, yeah. They're, both. They're, they're vital, aren't they? Dry palette or wet palette? Wet palette, although 
I don't, I don't preach that you have to use a wet palette to be a good painter, nor mm -hmm. will using a wet palette make you a good painter. Yeah. But they are, they are very useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Luke Skywalker, Imperial Assault or Legion? In terms of versions. Legion. 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 Both Legions, although I've not painted the Jedi Luke yet. I have built it and primed it and yeah. both, both awesome. Okay. Pink Floyd or John Williams? Oh, oh God. Um, <laughs> I like them both. I think overall, um, you'll, you'll more often hear me listening to John Williams, but I do like Pink Floyd as well. Okay. Yeah, I've, I was actually listen, watching one of your, I don't remember which one it was, one of your videos, and my wife happened to be walking through the room in here, and she said, is that Pink Floyd? <laughs> and because something in, in one of the background music you did, she said it just has a it has a touch of Floyd to it. So oh, that's, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's that's actually what what prompted that question. All right, final in the lightning round. Minis from the Mandalorian. I want them now, or I want them right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, as as enticing as that prospect is, if I look, I glance to my left. I have a shelf of shame. <laughs> Assembled and primed miniatures waiting to be painted. Yeah. It'd be great to have them. But I know they would end up somewhere amongst that. And it just, it would, it's, not, it's not good for my psychological health. <laughs> yeah. But at some point. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, I really enjoy your videos. I, I have watched, I, I will admit, I'm a fanboy of your videos. I've watched each one multiple times because I always learn something new. But I, as a, your patrons get PDF guides that you release uh, to, to to talk about the colors and to go into figures that don't make it to the video. Um, and those are also very good and very useful. Hey, have you ever thought about releasing a book about painting minis? Uh, not, uh, not, not, I'm not giving it any serious thought. No. Mm -hmm. my, my, my heart lies in the creation of the videos, really. Yeah because the video lets me, I hope, lets me communicate something more than just information about, well, information, what paints I'm using, what techniques I'm using, etc. I can sort of hopefully convey something about my love of the theme of mm -hmm. the game that I'm covering. Mm -hmm. And there's something magical about that process of seeing a colorless piece of plastic slowly become imbued with life and color mm -hmm. that doesn't quite translate in a, in a PDF or, or a book. Mm -hmm. The PDFs are useful. And it was actually my patrons that originally suggested it a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, it's, it's a useful way for me to, to cover more miniatures, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're figures that don't require me to demonstrate something new in terms of technique. It's really just techniques you've seen me do in the video lots of times here's the colors i've used for this this miniature and that's all mm -hmm. the information you need but it's just a it's a slightly joyless type of media to produce because it's missing the music the pacing uh, yeah so someone used the word in on in one of my youtube videos just the last week it was it was it was the thanos video he, he described the videos as intoxicating mm. And I thought that's a really nice word because it's it it tells me that he's enjoyed he enjoys the experience of of watching yeah. and listening to the video. So it's possible I might I don't know. And also I think a book a book there's something kind of permanent and definitive about a book. Mm -hmm. It sort of suggests that um, this sounds odd, but it might suggest that I'm I, I I see myself as some kind of authority on miniature painting, which which I don't feel like. I just, and I suppose that's why I like the format of videos I produce because each video is nothing more than me simply sharing my approach to painting mm -hmm. this particular miniature from this particular game at this particular time. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. I'm not saying um, is here's the best way to paint white, for example. Yeah. Um, this is just how I've chosen to paint this this white jacket on on Kingpin, for example. Yeah. So. For, for those reasons, I, I think my heart will always lie in the video creating side of things. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe, maybe a memoir or something in 20 years' time. <laughs> maybe something down the road. And it's yeah. it's interesting. You you talked about, like, for example, painting white. I mean, you've 
you've painted various stormtroopers, you've painted clone troopers. You, you, the kingpin had a lot of white on it. His jacket was white, and each of those has a slightly different approach. I, I was painting a a clone trooper recently, and I looked at your clone trooper video and your mix of contrast paints to get that look and then highlight it. And that worked really well. So I, I see what you're saying. There's, there's always a slightly different way of doing everything that may be approachable by one, you know, a little more approachable by some, uh, you know, that was the one that worked for me. So yeah, that, yeah. that, that I get that. I get that. As someone who watches your work a lot, I, I see that you also like trying different equipment for the filming and for the videos. Uh, that almost becomes a hobby in and of itself. You, you had a really great video about uh, one of the mechanisms you have from manipulating the camera and the angles and things like that. Did, what's on the radar there? Is there any new equipment that you have or anything you wish you have that you wanna upgrade to? What can we see uh, in the future there? The main thing I want to get next is a second camera. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy with what I have for what I mainly use it for, but I need something ideally with better focus tracking, mm. partly for when I'm doing those moving shots mm -hmm. with the camera slider. Yeah. Um, at the moment with this, because the tracking's really poor on it. So I'm pointing at something you can't see, my <laughs> Lumix GH5. It's okay if I'm using uh, sliding shots because the, the focal depth is, is the same. Mm -hmm. But if I have shots where the camera's moving into or out of the scene, it, yeah. it can't, it's just a struggle. It can't do it. Can't do yeah. it. Whereas Sony has some cameras, camera bodies that have amazing um, tracking. Mm -hmm. um, so I want, I want, I want one of those partly to get those, those moving shots where I'm moving into or out of a scene, mm -hmm. but also to allow me to, possibly explore the idea of doing battle reports oh yeah because the camera is obviously going to be moving around the whole time you know at once maybe have a fixed camera on the table to, to, to give an overview of the table, mm -hmm. but i want something that's really going to on a little gimbal maybe that's going to really get into this into the scene yeah so for that i do need something with better better tracking yeah yeah, that and, and I will say that I like I said I love your videos, but it was so fascinating to see kind of the behind the scenes process for how that piece of equipment worked for moving and for tracking and you know starting out here and coming along here and then zooming in on it. That was that was really fascinating. I appreciated that. No, oh, you're welcome. They're, they're lovely products. So for anyone who's listening, it's a company called Edelchrome, mm -hmm. and they make motorized camera sliders, but also panning heads which can also be tilting heads and it's a very modular system so you could have as many as you want and it's all controlled via the app it's very slick yeah but just very very slow super smooth movement where you've got full control of, of what you're doing it, it, it looks like it would be fun to to because painting the minis is fun but then just setting up the shot and and letting the creativity come out there i can imagine that would be a lot of fun well yeah because and it's also it's the it's the culmination of of the process of painting the miniature, building the scenery, all in the service of celebrating the theme. Yeah, um, and getting those those final shots of of the miniatures with the scenery is kind of the end result. It's the pinnacle of what you what you've been driving towards. That's that's why I find it so satisfying. Yeah, yeah. Now, in preparing for this, I watched a lot of your older videos. I want to, even though I watched them before, I watched some of the older ones, kind of. I guess you'd say the middle ones and then the more recent ones. And, you know, while you can look and see progression, the underlying theme that I see in all of them is the teacher in you coming out. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things I appreciate is, is it's, it's as much an enjoyable process as it is a learning process. Um, and I think it shows you you convey that hey you can do this you can replicate this so in terms of what you're doing and and just continuing the process what what do you have as far as future plans i know you just mentioned the battle reports do you have any other future plans in terms of evolution and growth and yet just staying with that that underlying core style of here's how i do it here's a way you can do it 
and it's it's very much a teaching process. Where where do you see the channel being? Where do you see you being in a couple of years? Uh, well, thank you for the kind words. Firstly, um, I, I don't see the core format of what I do changing much, particularly for the reasons I've given. That it's just, yeah, yeah. I love that magic of seeing the unpainted figure becoming full of yeah. color and life and the thematic experience. And I, I do know that um, the style of my videos allows for people to enjoy them in a range of ways. Some people mm -hmm. do like to just sort of paint by numbers and follow more or less everything I'm doing. Other more experienced painters might just skim through and pick out a few ideas here or there. Even mm -hmm. if they're not painting the figure, they might just um, take on board some of the principles and then apply them to, yeah. to whatever else. So hopefully they're, they're, they're there to be enjoyed by people for, for many different reasons. I know some people just have them on to have to relax. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I've had I've had people, um, ex ex service veterans who have actually mm -hmm. had problems, and they've said that just watching and listening to the videos really helps calm them. It lowers their blood pressure. Blood pressure. Um, yeah, and some people sleep to them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they just find them the the, the the sound mix is is peaceful and calming. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So so what's uh, in terms of future content? I think battle reports would be exciting to try at some point. Mm -hmm. um, the country's still in a sort of semi-lockdown state, so getting people yeah. over and stuff could be tricky at the moment. But it's something that I've got an eye on for the future, possibly. And there's always the chance I could do um, uh, videos that just discuss a topic, for example, mm -hmm. the kind of things that I get asked a lot in, in the comment section of a video, like how do I look after my brushes and why do I Zenithal Prime if I'm then using opaque colors on top? Yeah. Just purely from a, the point of view that it might be useful to viewers for me to just sit down for two minutes and talk about one of those things. Mm -hmm. So that people then know and, and that it preempts people asking the same questions, perhaps. Yeah. I, I think it would be one of those things that I wouldn't find as much pleasure in because I'd enjoy the thematic thing. I'm not mm -hmm. most comfortable in front of a camera either, to be honest. So, but it might be something I could do. Uh, to run alongside the, the core kind of content that I like to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when somebody asks those questions, you could just put up a link. Well, I, I covered that in yeah. this video. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Here it is. And and I guess even in the videos that you're doing, where you are doing a particular figure, you could because quite often you'll I, you'll you'll say in preparing in doing one video, you'll say I primed it as I did in episode one. Yeah. And and, you know, that would give you the chance of of saying, OK, here's how you use a wet palette. Here's yeah. here's what a contrast paint is. So, well, that would be inter I, I know I would I would enjoy seeing that. But certainly I like seeing your figure painting first and foremost. So so uh, well, that's good. And also it's, it's worth noting that I mean, there, there are lots of more YouTube YouTubers who yeah. do cover that stuff and do it really well. Probably I, I don't I don't watch much YouTube, but um mm. You know, Miniac's huge, and he's, he's he's very prolific in his output. Um, this uh, Age of Squidmar, mm -hmm. fantastic content, and they produce stuff a lot more regularly than me. That does deal with on a, in a sort of topic based way. With yeah, the, the the stuff out there for everyone, I think. Yeah, which is great. Yeah, yeah. There's if if uh, if you can't find it on YouTube, it's probably not possible. <laughs> you know, there's there's so much content out there. So, yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join me today for this interview. I am really grateful, and and I know uh, the folks who view this are going to really be interested in in what you've said and your approach to things. And uh, and I will I will say as a fan, uh, please do continue doing what it is you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I will keep doing my best for as long as I can. Great, great. Well, that's awesome to hear. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed sitting down and talking with Mark. It was just a great, great time to talk. And I really appreciate it, Mark, that you took the time to do that. Thank you very much. Again, there's going to be some links down below to not only his YouTube channel, but to his Patreon. So please give him some support. If nothing else, subscribe to his channel, watch his videos. I guarantee you're going to learn a lot from it. 
Well, that's going to wrap it up for this October edition of The Last Tuesday Show. Uh, the links to all the things that I've mentioned are going to be down below. There's also a link down over here to subscribe to this YouTube channel. If you're not already a subscriber, please click that little icon and also hit the little bell icon so you'll know when I have new videos out. I have links also to the social media that I'm on and to my blog. Check those out if you've not done so. And I also have a link to my Patreon account. And I would be most grateful if you would just take a look at that and see if one of the offerings there is something that might interest you. And of course, if you're already a patron, thank you so much for supporting me and the work that I do. It really makes this possible. And my family and I are so very grateful for the fact that you step up and help us with this every month. Thank you very much. And finally, as I always like to do, I'll close today with one thought. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.